Hey everyone, this is Amit Kira with Splunk. This is an updated video walking you through setting up your AWS environment for the Splunk app for AWS and Splunk add-on for AWS. This video is updated for the Splunk version uh, 5.1 of the app and 4.4 of the add-on, which are the latest and greatest as of the time of this recording. And throughout this video, I'm going to have different sections. Each section is going to have a slide like this at the beginning. So when you fast forward or reverse, you can look for the slide to see what section that might be of interest to you. And I'm going to cover quite a bit in this video. First, I'm going to cover setting up Splunk through an MI, applying permissions, roles, and even if you need to monitor a different account, uh, how to go through about assume role, setting up popular services like CloudTrail and Config, then VPC flow logs even, uh, how to set that up with a Kinesis stream, get some notes about centralizing data when you have many accounts that you're managing, as well as even what if you have a custom file that you want to parse in Splunk, you want to bring it to Splunk. What's the process of taking that file written to an S3 bucket and bring it into Splunk? And then uh, just uh, doing some troubleshooting as well at the end. So let's get started. Now let's go ahead and set up a Splunk instance and put the add-on and app for AWS on it. And the easiest way to do that is to go to your AWS console. And from there, you're going to want to go to AWS Marketplace, click on the Learn More here, open in a new tab, and then search for Splunk. And then you'll have a few options that appear. Uh, Splunk Enterprise is what we're going to do, where you basically stand up your own Splunk instance in your managed AWS environment. Uh, there's also a similar one for Splunk Insights for AWS Cloud Monitoring. Uh, this is different in that it allows you to only configure uh, AWS inputs, nothing else. Uh, it's for purely only AWS monitoring. Uh, then there's also a Splunk Cloud uh, ability to sign up here, but I believe this is also limited to uh, lower volume. So we're going to do Splunk Enterprise. And we're going to click here, go to our own region, US West Oregon, continue. And then next screen, we'll want to validate some of these settings. In my case here, regarding EC2 instance type, for testing purposes, I like the M4 large because it's a balance of cost and decent uh, memory and CPU uh, footprint. Then we got to also assign this into a particular VPC and subnet. Security group, we have to either create a new group uh, based on these settings here or update an existing security group to at least have uh, port 22 and 8000 here at the least open. Um, and then keep here so you can SSH to that EC2 instance down the road. And then once uh, you're ready there, you can just click with one launch. One other thing we will have to update uh, later on though is once this is provisioned, it only has eight gigabytes of EBS storage. So it doesn't state that here, but there's only eight gigabytes of EBS storage. We need to increase that to something like 50 or 100, maybe more, if this is gonna be an actual Splunk server with indexes. At this point, the AMI is up. We validated that we can access it, and here it is with a running state. However, we really need to increase the EBS storage uh, because it's only at eight gigabytes, and once there's less than five gigabytes available, Splunk basically will be at a standstill. There needs to be, by default, at least five gigabytes of space available in the, where Splunk is installed. So let's go and update this. First, we need to ideally stop Splunk. So we're going to go to our instance over here, and once we're in here, We're going to stop Splunk with opt Splunk bin Splunk stop. And here I sudoed in as the Splunk user. And then once Splunk is stopped, we'll be at a good spot where we can now come in back into the EC2 console and go to actions, instant state, stop. And once this stops, we'll now be able to update the EBS settings. We'll basically go down to over here and find root device dev x VDA and um, click on this EBS ID. That'll bring it up in another tab over here. At this point, we can go, the instance is stopped. We go to actions with this selected, and we go to modify volume, and now we'll change this to 108. Yes, and at this point, we can go back to EC2 dashboard instances, and here is the AMI. We can now restart this. Also, don't forget that when you restart the image, it's going to have a different IP address, most likely, unless you assigned a uh, elastic IP to it. And so in this case, we got to copy this new address and put it in our URL here uh, to connect to Splunk. So there we go. This is the same instance, just a different IP. And here's what happens if you do not update your EBS volume to be greater than 8 gigabytes, which comes installed out of the box with the AMI. Uh, here is the running instance of the 
AMI, and if I go here to messages, I have the minimum free disk space has been reached, and I look at this health dashboard, could not create search because it can't access the indexes, and uh, the system's basically at a standstill. So this is why you need to immediately update the EBS volume uh, to 50 gigabytes at the least upon installation. Let's now work through configuring AWS permissions and creating what's called an EC2 service role. So first we need the policy. What's the best way to know what needs to go in this policy? We want to do a Google search for AWS Splunk policy. And one of the first links that should come up here is this uh, documentation from Splunk, documentation add-on, configure AWS permissions. You want to click on that. And within that link for the Splunk documentation, we want to find an all-in-one policy. So if we scroll down, there's configure one policy containing permissions for all inputs. Let's go ahead and copy that. Now, mind you, this is, these are permissions for the Splunk add-on to be able to access various features or capabilities uh, in the a AWS API. You might still need other permissions for things like creating a Kinesis stream or mapping it from a VPC flow log, CloudWatch log group to uh, the, the Kinesis stream itself. Uh, but in this case, for the add-on, we want to copy all of these permissions. And then now we want to jump to our management console, EC2 management console or <laughs> AWS management console. And we're going to go under IAM. And we're ready to paste these permissions into a new policy. So we're going to go to policies, and we're going to create new policy. In this case here, I'm just going to do JSON. Uh, and this look and feel might change over time, as I'm finding out with AWS. And we're just going to paste here the policy. And then review policy. Everything seems to check out. We'll give it a name. I like to put an A underscore at the beginning, uh, just so that they float up to the top. And once I'm done, just create policy. And once that's done, you should then see it listed right here, this A Splunk access. Once the policy is created, we're ready to map it to a role. So we're going to come to roles, create role, and here's where we're going to do AWS service, and then EC2. Once we're under EC2, we're going to select here the use case of EC2, and next permissions, and then we're going to map what we just created, this A Splunk access, uh, to that role. And give this role a name. and create role. And then once you do that, now we're ready to associate this role with the EC2 instance that you have Splunk AWS add-on running. So we go to services, we go to EC2, look at your, your instances. So here's my AWS app AMI. I'm going to select that one, go to actions, instance settings, and attach replace IAM role. And then once I'm in there, I'll select the one that I just created the Splunk EC2 role, and that's it. With this, we're basically enabling the Splunk add-on that's running in your own AWS managed environment to discover this role and the permissions associated with this role. This circumvents you from having to put any secret keys or any other keys when doing the add-on configuration. This is also all described in our documentation under the setup add-on, discover an EC2 IAM role. So now let's go ahead and launch into Splunk. So here's my instance. So I need to go to this IP address over here, colon 8000. And first time logging in, so admin is the user, and then the password is the EC2 instance ID. So back to here again, get that EC2 instance ID, which is this guy. And control V, sign in. And now I have to change my password. Okay, so now that I'm done with that, that will now take me to the Splunk homepage, and I can now install the AWS app and AWS add-on. So to do that, we'll just go up here to our little icon, little gear icon. We can either click Browse More or Install App from File if we downloaded it. Let's click Browse More Apps. Let's now search for AWS. There's a Splunk app for AWS. We're going to install that, and we're going to put in our information, our Splunk ID. Okay, we're going to choose to restart later. Let's finish adding these other apps first. Restart later. Uh, we've done the Splunk app. Now we want the add-on. So Splunk add-on for AWS. Same credentials. And similarly, restart later. And then now let's also search for Python. And we should see here Python for scientific computing. We want the for Linux 64-bit version. Install that. 
And once this is installed, we'll be able to restart the Splunk environment. So now restart now. And there we go. Now next we should have the uh, Splunk environment up and running and ready for us to configure. Now I want to validate this auto discovery of the role that I just assigned to my AWS add-on EC2 instance. So let's jump into our AWS console, get the IP address of our instance. So in my case, AWS app AMI, get the IP address. Then I'm going to open a new tab, colon, whoops. Here it is, right? You need to put colon 8,000 at the end. And then once you log on, in this case, I was already logged on, but once you log on, you'll want to go into the Splunk add-on for AWS. You can see that I have other apps here installed. Uh, I'm not going to worry about those. Splunk add-on is the one I care about. And then within here, we want to go to the configuration tab. It's going to start in inputs. You want to go to configuration. And what's under the accounts section now, and this is loading, this now, here we go, just uh, automatically appeared and saying yes to auto-discovered IAM role. So by doing this, by doing what we did in the previous step, all those permissions are now inherited uh, into, into here. After validating your account connection or the auto discovery, this is also a good time to create the first input, and that is a description input. Think of that as an auto discovery. And so you're going to need to do this for every account or every assume role that you have. Uh, but once you do this, notice that it's going to basically create an inventory of all of these different services in AWS. And by default, it's going to run every 3,600 seconds uh, and populate. You can change that at your own will. Uh, but know that that should be another thing there that you should be ready to do. And here's what some of those events look like from AWS description once they come into Splunk. And again, this will basically act as a, an inventory of what's out there. Also populate various dashboards as well as lookups on the Splunk side. Um, so here are some of the events. And if we go to the statistics here with this table, uh, at least you can see some of the fields that are being populated, what source they're coming from, what region they're representing, and so on. Let's now cover assume role capabilities where you can have the Splunk add-on assume the role of different users in your organization. And this comes in handy because most organizations do have many accounts, many users, each doing their own thing, but you still need to capture data from those instances and be able to present it centrally, centrally manage it, correlate it, and so on. That's where assume role capabilities come in, where we'll basically have the account that Splunk is logging in as on the left-hand side here, assume different roles for account one, assume a role for account two, and so on, and then get insights into those environments. Here are the steps that we're going to go through to make this happen. Steps one and two are done on the AWS side. Step three is a short step done on the Splunk add-on side. To assume a role, we first need to get the AWS ID of our central or master account. So if I'm logged into my master account, which I am in this console, I basically find my username up here, my account, and then the ID number will be at the very top of that screen. Then I have to go into my end user account, uh, one of my end users account, or have them execute basically the next set of steps on that account. And here I launched into Safari, which is logged into a different uh, AWS account. And you can see I have no instances running in this one. Uh, but in here, I need to go back to services. And I go to IAM. And from here, this is where I now want to first create a policy like we did before this access for Splunk. So if I go into here, this policy, that is what got copied from the Splunk documentation. And once I create that policy, I can now go to roles. I can create a role. And this time we're going to do another AWS account that is going to be able to assume that role. We're going to paste our ID in here and then go next to do permissions. And then once we have the permissions uh, defined, or the map to that policy, we should then basically be able to see our role here created. So here's this assume role example that I created with that source account. And then once that role is created with the policy assigned to it, we now need to take this URL. And this is what we're going to be passing into the Splunk add-on. So we are still at this point within the source account, not the central account. We are within the source account where we're capturing this uh, particular URL. So now that I've copied it, and let's just do it this way too, copy link, and go back into our Splunk instance. So we're going to go to configuration. We're going to now click on IAM role. And in there, we can go add. We're going to give this a name, my other account, and paste that whole ARN in there. Okay? And once that's done, uh, we are now ready to add inputs and map them to this particular uh, account. And you can see I've already added this in here from before, but that's the, the, the process. And similar to before, since we just added an assume role, this is also a good time to add a description input for that assume role. Uh, I already have that here for my peer account, 
And so just pointing to that one assume role and have it also uh, discover the respective regions. And then validating the data is actually coming in uh, or data does come in. You can go to your Splunk search, put in uh, that account, and you might need to wait a little while for this, uh, give it a few minutes, maybe even up to an hour uh, for it to catch up, uh, but then you can validate all of the different configurations or a lot of the configurations that are coming in. Assume role is great. However, what do you do when you have tens or even hundreds of accounts? Is assume role really the best way? That's where you want to reconsider and maybe have a centralization strategy. Depending on what the AWS input is, whether it's CloudWatch logs in this case, or config or CloudTrail, the strategy will vary, but they all have a, a common theme, and that is centra centralization. In the case of the CloudWatch logs that we have here, you're going to have all of the different accounts basically subscribe to a central Kinesis Firehose or Kinesis Stream that then Splunk can capture data from or have data sent to. What's the benefits of this? It's not just on the Splunk side where you have less administration, significantly less administration, but it's also your use of the AWS API. You'll have reduced charges from using less of the AWS API and uh, just a, a more manageable environment. Earlier, we configured an AWS policy which enables the add-on to talk to the AWS API. Now we have to configure some services so that they make data available for the add-on to read. Let's cover the steps to set up AWS CloudTrail. With the Splunk add-on for AWS version 4.3 and 4.4, we introduced a much better, much more scalable way of processing CloudTrail, even config data. And that's via what we call SQS-based S3 input. This also applies to other sources like ELB logs, uh, ALB logs, Cloud, CloudFront logs, and so on. But the way it basically works is CloudTrail first gets enabled in step one. We enable writing the data to an S3 bucket. And in step two, within that S3 bucket, then we go and configure what we call a notification to an SQS queue. The Splunk add-on basically subscribes to that SQS queue. So it knows whenever there's an update, and then it goes and fetches those uh, changes or those updates uh, later on. There's also this concept of a dead letter queue, because what happens if you have error messages? They'll just stay in the SQS queue uh, by default. And the Splunk add-on will keep pulling and thinking there are new events. And they'll just get registered as errors every time. So we need a place to put these error messages outside of this queue that the Splunk add-on is subscribing to. That's what's called. Here are the steps to actually set up CloudTrail now. Uh, and what we really have to do is think backwards looking at this diagram. So first we need to create the dead letter queue. Then we create the real queue that the add-on is going to uh, subscribe to. And then we can configure CloudTrail. And in CloudTrail, we're going to tell it right to an S3 bucket. And from there, we're also going to go back into the queue and update permissions so that these, this S3 bucket can actually send notifications to it. Um, so the steps are all laid out right here. The main thing to consider here, or just to remember, for the regular queue, you need a visibility timeout of five minutes and a max receive of one under re read drive policy. Also, in the S3 configuration for it to send notifications to SQS queue, we're going to select object create all. Following the steps we just laid out to set up CloudTrail, we first have to create the two SQS queues. So we go under messaging, simple queuing service within our AWS console, and we're going to create two new queues. First one is a dead letter queue. It's a standard queue, doesn't require any special configuration or extra configs, so we're just going to do quick create queue. But now the next one is going to require some special configs. So this is the SQS queue that the S3 bucket will send notifications to. Uh, so here we're going to call this SQS and configure queue this time. Here, default visibility timeout needs to be at least five minutes or 300 seconds. And then we're going to do a use redrive policy and specify that dead letter queue we just created. Uh, and the maximum receives, we want this to be no more than one. If you have it more than one, you can have multiple of the same errors appear on the Splunk side, and it might indicate to you or lead you to believe that you have a bigger problem than you do. Uh, and then the dead letter queue, this is where it's a hit or miss for me. As I as you type, it should pick up other queues that it, uh, you have created. If it doesn't, it means it, it just you haven't waited long enough, so you might have to come back later and uh, update this. For now, I'm just going to use one of the existing ones that I've already created and create queue. And so now any error messages will go into this CloudTrail dead letter from this YouTube SQS. We'll come back in here also in a minute and cover permissions. Next step is to configure CloudTrail itself and enable a trail. So we've got a CloudTrail, Trails, Create Trail. And in this case, Apply Trail to All Regions is acceptable. In the past, with the prior setup, uh, we recommended a no. But this one is more flexible with the SQS-based S3 inputs. All write, read events. And there's also, in the AWS console, a new feature here where you can log S3 bucket access uh, as CloudTrail logs. So you can enable that if you like. But down here, create a new S3 bucket. And we're going to call this YouTube 
dash cloud trail. And uh, let's see, this was created earlier and deleted, but let's see if it takes it. Create. And at this point, it's creating it, created the S3 bucket, and is pointing all uh, of the data into there. Now, we need to go and uh, update, make an update here to our SQS queue so that we can do the next step. Uh, we need to update the permissions here. So we're going to go back in here, select this YouTube SQS, go to permissions. And notice if I click on add a permission, I only have principles and what those principles can do that I can select from here. So I can either do everybody and all SQS actions or at least uh, a write send message. Or what I need to do in order to limit it to just a specific S3 bucket is create a policy. So I have to do edit policy document and I have to paste a policy in here that limits access to an S3 bucket. And for that, this is where I leverage the wealth of information in AWS documentation. In this particular document that is within this URL right here that I just found through Google search, I have example of an IAM policy that you attach to a destination SQS queue. So let's copy this. And another note here, I have better luck copying by highlighting the text versus clicking on the copy. That's a no-no here that has resulted in some errors uh, in my history. So copy this, go back to our configuration for SQS here, paste this in here. And then the only thing we have to change here is the bucket name. So the bucket name started with YouTube. So we can just do YouTube wildcard. So any YouTube uh, bucket name that starts with that, we'll be able to write to this queue and or notify this queue. Review policy, it likes it, save changes. At this point, we can now go into our S3 bucket. And here it is, YouTube CloudTrail that was created uh, when we were at, within the CloudTrail trail. And at this point, we want to click on the S3 bucket name. We want to go to properties. And we want to come down here to events. So click on events, add notification. Give it a name. And actions or events, you want to do object create all. Object create all. And you're going to send to SQS queue, select that queue we created earlier. So that was the YouTube SQS queue and save. If there were any permission issues, you would have had an error in that last step. So because we took care of it, we applied a policy at the SQS level. We did not get an error within the screen. And that's it for configuring CloudTrail through SQS based S3 input on the AWS side. Now that you've configured the AWS side enabled CloudTrail, you're ready to configure the Splunk side. And that's a relatively easy process of just coming into the add-on, going into inputs, and then we're going to create a new input of CloudTrail type. We did an SQS-based S3, which is a recommended one, and then you'll have a screen pop up similar to this one here. And then you just fill in the blanks. Here is one I already have completed previously. And so with that, we just have the account. Uh, we have the region that's populated, uh, as well as a queue, and that's it. And then once that's saved, you can then validate that you have data coming into Splunk. Uh, you can either go look at your Splunk app for AWS and see if there's any notable CloudTrail activity uh, that has popped up in here. Uh, also, what I like to do is just open a search in uh, another window here. So uh, source type equals AWS CloudTrail and see what events have come in. Uh, you can also change this to all time real time or one minute window and see what events are streaming in that are CloudTrail related. Depending on when you watch this video, if the Splunk app for AWS version 5.2 is out, you can pursue the SQS based S3 input previously described. Until then, you want to pursue this legacy method that we're going to go over uh, so that data in the app is correctly represented. And that method has worked very well. And here it is described uh, in detail. So config, AWS config is set up to write data to an S3 bucket. It also sends data to an SNS topic, which subscribes to or publishes to an SQS queue. The Splunk add-on then subscribes to that SQS queue to see when there are any updates, and then go goes and fetches those updates uh, with step five. And until version 5.2 or 5.3 of the app is out, this is the method you want to pursue uh, so that, again, data within the app is adequately represented. The flow for setting up AWS config is very similar to what was in the slide we just showed. So first, we need to go into config, and we need to enable config. So we're going to go under settings, and we need to turn it on. In my case here, it's already on, but you'd want to go ahead and turn this on, enable resources here, and you're going to write it. You're going to probably create a bucket, so have it write it to a brand new S3 bucket, and make sure to follow naming conventions. So you can't use underscores or a few other characters, I believe, or capitals. Um, so all lowercase and dashes, as I have here. This part now is important uh, for it with the legacy method, where we're going to create an SNS topic. We're going to stream this to an SNS topic, and in your case, first time, you're going to create a topic, give it a name, and then also it needs a role 
uh, associated with it. So I opted to just create a new role the first time I did this, and then here it is displayed uh, versus you could also choose a role and select a role that you already created uh, afterwards. Once you save that, you can go back to services and we need the SNS topic got created, but the SQS queue has not been created yet. So we need to go to SQS queue and we need to basically create a new uh, queue here that's going to be for that uh, legacy config method. And so I already have one here. So if I just go select this and edit, so just to show you configure queue, nothing special about it here. Um, this is optional, this config letter, legacy dead letter, that's, that's optional. Uh, but what we have to do next here after creating this queue is queue actions and subscribe queue to SNS topic. And then this is where we select the topic that was uh, previously created and subscribe. And so now that we have done the subscription, now that we've written writing to an S3 bucket, we are done on setting up config. Uh, however, the downside is that we've only done it for one region. We're going to have to go through all our other regions and do the, repeat the same process. And now that you've configured AWS config within the AWS side, now you're ready to come in here on the Splunk side and add a config input. Now, in this case, we are not doing the newer SQS-based S3. We're doing the old-fashioned config input that we want to select. And so once we select that, you'll have a screen similar to this appear. Um, what's nice about this is uh, we can add multiple regions in here. So if we put in the account and add all the different regions, and we can map it here to one queue, right? And we don't have one for Singapore. Let's go back down here, go Oregon, and select our CloudTrail, uh, or excuse me, config uh, SQS here. So I call that config legacy. And I can add another, so I can keep adding as many as I need in one configuration, which is a nice feature. And then once I'm done with that, I should have a, an input type here of config, like this config legacy one here. And if I edit that just to show what it looks like, there it is, just how we saw before. And then once I've saved them and maybe waited a couple of minutes, I'm ready to come and validate that I see data. So I can come to the Splunk dashboard for the app uh, overview page. And if I see these counters increment, I know that data has been processed. And for me, I personally like to instead run a search where I do source type equals AWS colon config. And there I can see then all of the events for the last few minutes or last 24 hours here that have come in. Uh, so like with the uh, cloud trail, you can change this to all time real time or all time or a five minute window, one minute window and see events as they come streaming in. In the search, I like to do AWS colon config star because you have multiple source types here. Uh, we haven't covered config rule input type, but that's another input that we can add. Uh, but then config takes care of config and config notification. And while we're at it for the config rule, uh, if we create new input, here is a config rules input. And at the end of the day, here's one we already have, and here's what it looks like. So very similar to uh, just a regular config. What about CloudWatch? What service configuration is required for the Splunk add-on for AWS to pull CloudWatch metrics? The answer is nothing. There's no special service configurations required, just the permissions that we previously applied. And creating a CloudWatch input is also very easy on the Splunk side. So we just go to create new input and CloudWatch. And this is a much improved interface over prior versions. So we just give it a name, uh, give it the account. Then it picks up, tells us which region. So we're going to say US East Virginia. And by default here, it has these nine services for which it'll capture data. Uh, but if you do edit in advanced mode, this is a much improved interface, as I mentioned earlier. You can come in here and add namespace. And then just as you start typing, uh, and uh, you can see all the available namespaces here. So if you're leveraging any of these capabilities or any of these features in AWS, you can select that namespace, and then you have to enter. And notice that brings up over here stream name, uh, the dimension value. We're going to do all dimension values, all metrics. But notice here are individual ones if you want to go just after specific ones. And then uh, statistical calculations on those fields. And once you're done, you just OK it and save, and that's it. And then once you're once it's done, it'll basically here's a, an entry that we've done previously uh, that has same similar results. To validate that you're processing CloudWatch data, you can just go to the app. So if we go over here uh, within the app, the overview page, some of the charts in there are CloudWatch fed. But in particular, if you go to the usage, any of these pages or majority of these pages are CloudWatch fed. So here is the one for EBS volumes telling me how much I, volume I have, uh, size distribution, and everything. Uh, also, there's the old-fashioned way of just running a Splunk search. So here we're running source type equals AWS CloudWatch, putting the results in a table, and then just taking fields that we saw in some of the events, metric dimensions, metric name, period, and average, and here we're just validating uh, results that we're getting. 
So pretty straightforward, pretty easy to see what kind of data you're getting from AWS and to Splunk for CloudWatch. Let's now talk about VPC flow logs. There are really three main ways of getting VPC flow logs into Splunk. They share the same common initial setup, but then at the CloudWatch log group, you're going to have a subscription filter to one of these three methods. We're going to go through Kinesis through exercise here uh, in a minute, but there's also a Lambda function and Kinesis Firehose, which can push data out to an HTTP event collector on the Splunk side. Kinesis Firehose is about to be released. It's currently in beta as of this uh, video, and it introduces more resiliency compared to Lambda uh, because there's a cache as well as waiting for the HTTP event collector to return a 200 code to say, hey, I got your messages. Do not pursue, whatever you do, do not pursue a CloudWatch logs input on the Splunk side. You will see it there, but it's going to be deprecated. But more importantly, you're limited by the AWS API's transfer rate. So there's a chance that you will miss data in the process. So let's go through the steps of setting up VPC flow logs through a Kinesis stream into Splunk. Create the CloudWatch log group first through the UI. Go into the VPC settings and point to that log group that you just created. Then you can create the Kinesis stream still through the UI. Uh, but then step four is where it's a bit more interesting and a little bit more involved on needing to map a Kinesis stream subscription filter to that CloudWatch log group. As of today, there's not a way to do it through the UI of AWS console. You have to use the CLI instead. The good thing is it's documented very well within this link that's available here. To set up VPC flow logs, we first need to create a CloudWatch log group to put them in. So we've got a CloudWatch under our AWS console. We go to logs and we're going to create a new log group by going to actions with create log group and with nothing selected there and give it a name. And now that we've created it, we can come back out here, go to VPCs and to enable it globally at the VPC level, we just click on VPC, select your different VPCs and then action, create flow log and then filter. We're going to no filters, just get everything in. Role. So you need a role that can capture the flow logs, but also write them to uh, that uh, log group. And in this case, we're going to use our blanket role that we created initially. And destination log group name. It's fetching the existing names. Here's the one that we just created. So we're going to point it there and create flow log. And at this point, it, it has, if we go here to flow log, it should have saved uh, what we just did. So now we have this, we can go back to our CloudWatch log group. And so come into logs. Here is this new log group for VPCs. If we click this and actions, notice under subscriptions, there's nothing in the UI that enables you to stream this to a Kinesis stream. There's only AWS Lambda and this other one here as well. We would have to go into the CLI and uh, basically map it to a Kinesis stream. So first let's create a Kinesis stream. So we can go back in, out here and then go into Kinesis. Uh, let's see. There it is. And I already have this VPC stream. But so once that stream is created, and let's just create a new one to show the process there. I'm going to use one shard, but depending on how much data, how much traffic you're generating, you might want to have this number larger. And in a production environment, you typically will want to have this number larger. And we'll call this temp stream create stream. So the process of creating it is pretty, so stream is created. You're now ready to map this or have the CloudWatch log group stream to it through a subscription filter. That is the part that requires the AWS CLI and it's not achievable through the AWS UI. So for that, this is where I consult the AWS documentation. Here is this page that was in uh, the, the slide deck. And if you go there, this walks through pretty nicely the steps to do this from A to Z. And we've already done steps one and two through the UI, creating a stream. And step three, there's a role we have to create, but we have to save the policy that maps to that role as a local file. And then we apply that here in step four, uh, where we upload this policy file basically uh, to the AWS CLI via this AWS IAM create role. Then step six, we're granting permissions to that role, the Kinesis put record. This might be where you might want to also change it and do Kinesis colon star if you like. And then a couple other steps here. Step six is where you're associating now the policy with the role, uh, again, still through the AWS CLI. Step seven and eight then round it out where you're uh, mapping the log group to the uh, Kinesis stream. And then also here in this last step, uh, taking care of some uh, permissions. So once that's all done and achieved, you are ready to map it on the Splunk side. But this step is required in order to publish VPC flow logs to a Kinesis stream. There's also uh, and will be some uh, templates out there, cloud CloudFormation templates that can automate a lot of this process. Uh, but this document goes through it pretty nicely.
There is one correction I have to make regarding permissions for the VPC flows. Uh, so when you're creating or enabling VPC flows at the VPC level, I did get an error down here, uh, access error right here in this message, uh, because apparently I did not have adequate permissions with just the add-on EC2 role that we created earlier. So to fix that, let's start over. Let's delete this guy. We're going to create flow log. And then this time here, we're going to fo uh, follow this wizard here to set up permissions. So we click on that set up permissions. It'll bring up another window uh, where it'll have this IAM role, flow logs role, and ask to create a new policy or to use an existing one. And then here is what needs to be in that policy, basically. So these log, create, des uh, describe, put log events in particular as well, uh, all need to be uh, enabled there. Uh, and the resource can be just for that VPC uh, itself. But uh, bottom line is this policy or a policy like this needs to be uh, in, in the system. And so if we go back here, uh, having created this earlier, here is this flow log role and destination log group back to the original one and create flow logs. And this should fix that problem. Enabling the VPC flow log collection on the Splunk side is a relatively easy process. Once you have the streaming to Kinesis complete, you just come in to the add-on under the input screen, go to create new input and come down to VPC flows. There's Kinesis that's recommended and we give it a name, put in an account, it loads the regions from the AWS CLI and we select the region where this was located and then it's now fetching the stream names and then here are the two of them. Uh, we select the one that has the VPCs or flows uh, stream to it. Um, and then the main things here, source type is VPC flow uh, and then you can change the index and put it in a different index and that's it. And to validate that you have VPC flows actually being processed in Splunk, you can go to the app. Uh, here is the Splunk app for AWS. Go to security and go to either one of these two pages, traffic or security analysis. Here is a security analysis page showing rejected and accepted traffic over time, as well as a map showing location of source and destination traffic. Uh, also color coding for the rejected versus accept. And then also the other way to just see what events are actually coming in, you can run a search of AWS CloudWatch logs colon VPC flow for your source type. And there you go. Then you'll see your VPC flows that way. So what are the best practices for VPC flow logs when you have many accounts? Well, like pretty much other services, the whole centralization strategy is what's most optimal, where you'll have the subscription filter that we went through here basically point to a centralized uh, Kinesis stream versus ones that are local to each one of these accounts. And by doing that, then this data in this case, it's not Kinesis Stream, but a Kinesis Firehose. Uh, that data will then be sent to uh, the Splunk HTTP event collector, and the Splunk add-on will not be involved at that point. Um, you could stream it to a Kinesis Stream instead of a Kinesis Firehose, and that Kinesis Stream then will involve a Splunk input that would fetch that data uh, and subscribe to that Kinesis Stream. Uh, but so large environments, you definitely want to pursue an aggregation strategy. What if you have custom files, custom data that you put in S3 buckets and you want to process them in Splunk. What's the process for that? It's actually pretty straightforward. The data is in S3. You just need adequate permissions to that S3 bucket, which you should have with the blanket policy that we applied at the very beginning. And then you're just going to uh, go into Splunk and have an add-on, a generic S3 input add-on. You will also need your own custom props and transforms uh, in order to tell Splunk, hey, here's how you need to process this data, right? Especially if there's no key value pairs or no JSON uh, in the event that you'll need the custom props and transforms. Additionally, I like to always prefix the source types with AWS colon S3 colon. That way, any uh, AWS S3 related props and transforms can also take place uh, as well. And this is ideal if the files are newly created or newly added every so often versus one file being updated over and over again many times. So I'm going to walk through the example of having custom files put into S3 buckets. In this case, there's another vendor, Soasta Impulse, that's part of Akamai, that is able to publish or put results from their product into your S3 buckets. So here's what that data might look like, and they put it in .log.gz files, and I wanna process this data in Splunk. Here is what the data might look like. So this is raw data coming from that utility, and now I wanna process that in Splunk. And so the process really, first you wanna create an app. So I like to first, before I do anything, the first time I do this is go to apps, manage apps, and then within the screen, create an app. And then I'll create an app where I can put all my customizations in. So I have a custom S3 files app. And then once I create it, I will basically have access to that on the back end. So I can go into my uh, local directory here within that app. 
and do all the props and transforms that I need. So here are the props that I'm going to be using for this particular data set. And with, here's the source type that I'm going to be assigning. So now that I have that in place, I'm ready to go to process this data in Splunk. So all I have to do is go into inputs and I want to create new input. In this case, it's going to be an S3 custom data type, generic S3. And I'll just give this a name. So Asta and then what permissions, credentials, I'm going to be logging in to access this information. It goes and fetches the S3 bucket, says, hey, here are the ones available. So I'm going to select the one where this data resides and additional options that are available. And then down here, source type. You can actually select this uh, drop down and then just type in AWS colon S3 colon uh, whatever name that I gave it over here. So that's this uh, Soasta impulse. So you can type in, do your own custom ones. You're not limited to just what was available in the drop down. And then once that's done, just enter index. Uh, let's put it in. Let's keep it in the main index here for now and save. And at this point, that data that's in that S3 bucket is loaded into Splunk. And anytime there's any update on a regular fetch from the add-on, it'll go and fetch the results from, uh, from AWS. So now let's validate that we have data from this custom S3 input we just added. So here's a search. We're just gonna have source type equals AWS S3 star. And to protect the innocent, we're only gonna return certain fields uh, from this data set and including source type and source and a few other fields. Let's change this to all time. And voila, we have data. So here is that source type that we specified in the input. Here's the source, including the S3 bucket name and the actual file that has been picked up. Um, and then there's also various fields of from the events found within those files. Right now here, looks like we're still just looking at one particular file. Uh, if we go further or many pages later, we'll see other files as well, or should see other files. Um, still the same one here. Let's see, it's to page 18. The, regardless, it's uh, many many data points here uh, that, that, that are captured. And here's all the fields as well that are within that event. And then furthermore, to just show what you can do with Splunk, here is now the same search, but now with geostats command. And let's uh, search over all time. And here we go. Now we can see, in this case, we're doing latitude, longitude, count by user agent type and visualizing where people are. So most people here are desktop. Uh, keep zooming in to get more granularity. So here in California, this part, you got mostly desktops uh, as well as over here. So most people are desktop with a few here more that are have a higher percentage of tablet or mobile. So you got everything set up, but you're having some trouble. So where do you start? There's troubleshooting inputs with the add-on version 4.4. There's a new set of dashboards that ship with it now that make it a heck of a lot easier to troubleshoot and understand where something might be broke or uh, permissions might be inadequate and so on. So this is a feature that is within the add-on version 4.4, but know that you can also run your own searches like the index equals underscore internal AWS star and so on. So let's see what that looks like. Here is the add-on and under the health check, this health overview, this page is out of the box. And so once you configure inputs, this will start populating. So like here, I have 10 CloudWatch errors uh, that have occurred here in the last one day. And if I go ahead and click on that, it will give me basically a list of what's going on. And so here it's configuration error, no valid metrics were returned under this metric dimension. So I am putting in some metric dimension that doesn't exist in my environment. I have not configured it on my AWS side. And so hence when I've enabled here on the Splunk side though, so it's giving me this error. So useful information for interacting with it relatively quickly. Also, there's this S3 input health details here. This page allows you to see that one, how much you're processing in your S3 input. So you can determine if you need to uh, size it differently or have additional heavy forwarders possibly, um, and any kind of errors as well. You, you'll see them down here, generic S3 error message. So if we had problems with that one input that we added earlier, we would see them here, right? But there aren't any. And uh, also, if we do go further back in time here, let's do the last 30 days, we should see some errors or some something else here appear. Going 30 days back in time here, we can see I had a lot of errors originally when I set this up, uh, as well as delay, but that some of this is anticipated just because uh, when the logs first happened versus when they were processed. Um, but then we look here at these errors, failed to parse message, failed to parse message. And this is where the dead letter Q comes into play for the SQS based S3. This is where we can then go to uh, that dead letter Q and look and see what events have come in uh, that might have not been processed. And in fact, if we go over there to our S3 console, S3 or AWS console and go find SQS. And then in the dead letter Q where those errors were, there should be a bunch of these events. And so here is dead letter Q. Um, and if we go ahead and now go Q actions and we want to view or delete messages and they'll do start polling. This is gonna pull the environment there and get basically all of these outstanding logs. And so if we click on more details for some of these, 
some of these right now are okay to see. Um, they're just uh, some of these messages that have not been parsed or are not set up to be parsed really uh, by the add-on. So instead they go into this bucket and eventually get deleted. This is also why you want that read drive policy to only process the files once, not many times, so that the Splunk add-on doesn't keep processing the same events over and over again. The last bit to show here is to get some additional granularity, you want to go to the configuration tab in the add-on and go to the logging section. You can turn on here various inputs and make them in debug mode like I had here previously. Now I'm just going to take them back to info. Uh, but this will enable additional logging as well so that when you're looking at these other dashboards like the S3 inputs health details, these messages will start to appear and more details would be provided in them. And where else can you go for help? There's always Splunk Answers, so answers.splunk.com. You can come in here, search for AWS or whatever problem you're having and see if anything there exists. Uh, the documentation also is a good place. So under, you can Google search for a majority of this, but so under the Splunk add-on for AWS and Splunk app for AWS, there'll be a troubleshooting section down here where you can get additional info or just see if the problem you're having uh, is documented here within this uh, set of pages. Uh, then you also have your account team on the Splunk side, as well as the ability to open tickets if you're a paid paying Splunk customer. Uh, so with that, thank you very much. Enjoy your Splunk and AWS journey.